How's it going everybody? Chris here. Just thought I'd do a quick one from home today and uh, talk about what I've done. First thing real quick, uh, for those who follow me on Instagram, you probably know that I just recently spent a week in Death Valley National Park uh, over the holidays and uh, it was a great trip. I shot a lot of photos, shot a lot of video. Still working on putting that video together though, so I thought this week maybe we could talk about what the heck this thing is, what I'm even doing with it. So uh, this is the Toyo View 45G large format 4x5 film camera. Uh, it was produced in Japan, was first available in 1977, I believe, from what I can tell. And if you aren't familiar with this style of camera, it employs an old school accordion looking bellow system to focus. Uh, and it's what's known as a view camera. So that just means that what you see on the back of this glass here, the view you see is what gets rendered to film. Uh, it shoots a four x five film negative, which looks a little something like this. Of course, this sheet's destroyed because it's been exposed to light. That's my practice sheet. And that goes into a film holder that looks a little something like this. Of course, you would do this in complete darkness. And then that gets put in the back of the camera right here. So this is actually my first large format film camera. Uh, I haven't even taken it out to shoot yet, but I thought the journey into learning large format film might make for an interesting story. So I figured I'd just start off with a video, just kind of checking over the camera and talking about all the things I put together in my kit. If this whole experiment goes well, maybe I'll make more videos and turn it into like a little series kind of talking about the things I've learned and how it's going. But if you absolutely hate this video, just thumbs down it and berate me in the comments and I'll never make another one like it. So I bought this camera off of an eBay seller out of Japan. And uh, one of the things that made it so attractive to me was that it kind of came as a whole kit and it was in really good condition too. So it came with a bunch of accessories bundled in with it. Uh, I got five film holders. I got an instant film back, which I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with because I don't even know how to use it. And a few other things, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, and the other thing I bought was this Fuji Fujinon 180 millimeter F 5.6 lens that's on the front of it. It's currently the only lens that I own for large format. And as I understand it, uh, kind of the general rule of thumb with large format lenses is you divide the focal length by three and that gives you roughly the equivalent in 35 millimeter. So at 180 mil, this would be kind of close to a 50 or 60 millimeter normal lens. So now right off the bat, this camera is a beast. Uh, total shipping weight on this was 16 pounds. Uh, just a little bit of a surprise to me. I didn't think it was that heavy. Uh, so I definitely won't be going backpacking with this thing. This camera uses what's known as a monorail setup. So it's got this central rail at the bottom here that kind of forms the backbone of the camera and the front and rear standards just slide back and forth on it like that. Now they do make field style cameras such as the Intrepid 4x5, which are vastly more lightweight and portable, uh, which I actually looked at. Uh, so why did I buy a monorail setup? Well, first off, this thing is super rigid. So everything on this thing is made of metal. It's all machined, uh, minus the plastic knobs and the bellows, uh, which means that when you lock an adjustment down, it stays put, it doesn't move. Uh, and this kit also came with an extension for the monorail, which screws on the front here and makes it possible to extend the bellows really far. Something like that. Now, why is that relevant? Well, I won't get into too much detail in this video. Uh, perhaps I will in the future and explain some of the physics behind some of these things I've learned if you guys are interested in that. So if you are, let me know down in the comments if you want me to do that. Uh, but the fast version is at infinity focus. That is to say everything in the distance is in focus. This camera should have a bellows extension. That is the distance between the film plane and the lens plane should be roughly equal to the focal length of the lens. In this case, this is a 180 millimeter lens. So the bellows extension should be roughly 180 millimeters. Now, in order to get the lens to focus on subjects that are really close, say a few feet or less, you have to rack the bellows out really far to get the distance between the film plane and the lens far enough to get the lens to focus, uh, which is something that's a little more difficult to do with the field camera. Uh, you can do some of that, but because of the trade-off, you know, with a little more portable system, uh, you just have some physical limitations there. Not so with this camera, especially with this extension rail, I can rack this really far out and focus really close, uh, which is exactly what I kind of envisioned when I decided to pull the trigger on a film camera. So of course I imagine I'll be shooting, you know, the grand vistas and greater, you know, bigger views and stuff with this camera as well. But one of the things I was really excited about with this format was uh, shooting really kind of closer subjects, uh, 
more intimate scenes that have smaller subjects where you just fill the view with like lots of textures and colors or details, you know, and this monorail system is perfect for that. So this guy's also got all the large format camera movement, bells and whistles you might hear about. You can focus with the front or rear. So both the front and the back you can use to focus. Both the front and rear have rise and fall. So you can raise the lens or raise the film plane or lower it. I've got front and rear swing. And I've got front and rear tilt. So you can tilt the lens or the film plane. And lastly, I've also got front and rear shift, which means you can shift left and right with the lens or the film plane. So all of them are there. I can, I can do all the movements, uh, which most field cameras will restrict you typically to just front standard movements, uh, maybe some of the rears, but it's not really that usual to see all of the camera movements available on a field camera. So if this one doesn't get in my way. It'll let me do anything I want, which may be a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but it gives me plenty of things to play with while I'm learning this format. So I'm kind of excited for that. So the question I get all the time is why film? Uh, it's a lot harder to work with. You have to develop it before you can see it. Uh, it's getting super expensive uh, and it's the year 2021 at the time of filming this. So why film? Well, for large format in particular, uh, there's a few common arguments I hear a lot. Uh, probably the most common one being resolution, which I kind of debate a little bit because the digital cameras of today are no slouches, especially like the medium format, high megapixel cameras like the Fuji GFX series or something. Um, I've even seen the analog process of capturing light on film being described as infinite resolution, which is just not true. Uh, for one thing, you're limited by the grain of the film which is one of the reasons to shoot a film negative that's this big, because the ratio of detail to film grain is a lot higher, therefore you capture more detail. And then you're also limited by the resolution of the scanner you use to digitize your, your negatives, unless you're completely analog and you do darkroom prints, in which case the reasonable size of photosensitive paper you would use to produce your prints on your enlarger, uh, by the time you created a comparable size print from a modern DSLR or mirrorless, uh, you might be disappointed at how little difference there is. Uh, so how about colors? Uh, well, and you can recreate the film look in post-processing just using color grades and uh, curves layers, pretty close anyway, uh, just a whole lot easier and with less hassle. So what is it then? Uh, well, for me, it's the process. Uh, film is expensive. This is a box of Kodak Ektar. It has 10 sheets of film in it, and this box cost me just shy of $45 from B&H Photo, plus shipping. Uh, add to that the cost of developing the film, which is anywhere from, you know, 4 to $6, depending on the type of film it is. Uh, and then I don't even have a reputable lab around me that I'm aware of that will do 4x5 sheet film processing. So I have to ship it out. So there's shipping costs and delays. That means all said and done, it very literally will cost me $10 or more just to hit the shutter button on this camera. Uh, each film holder has got two sides to it. There's an A and a B side. And I have five film holders. That means I can load this entire box of film and take it to the field with me. That still only gives me 10 shots. But that's a lot for large format. If you had 10 shots and they all turned out and they were all really good photographs, that's a really good day. Uh, so this whole thing just forces you to slow down, to really consider what it is you're shooting, whether or not it's the best time to shoot it, if the lighting conditions are the best it could be for that subject. Um, and in a very visceral way, it forces you to improve your technique and as a result, the quality of your photography. This camera is also nothing more than just a light proof box with a lens on the front and a bunch of adjustment knobs. In a lot of ways, I think the digital cameras today have gotten so complex. I mean, they're amazing, don't get me wrong. I love them to death, but they kind of just turn into this black box where you just push a button on the front, a bunch of magic happens inside and it deposits an image on a memory card for you. Because this thing, you have to actually do everything manually on. Uh, it does nothing automatically for you. You are very literally being more hands-on with the basic mechanics and fundamentals of creating an image and it teaches you more of how a camera works. So if you want to crank up the ISO in this camera, you can't just push a button. You have to choose a totally different film stock that has the ISO rating that you're looking for. The aperture is adjusted on the lens. You can actually see the aperture blades close down as you stop the lens down. The shutter is also on the lens. It's a mechanical spring that you cock manually and then trigger 
using a shutter release cable that is made of an actual cable. It's literally a cable. And then there's no LCD on the back and no histogram to help judge your exposure by. So you have to manually calculate each exposure you take uh, using a light meter, such as this one, which is the Pentax digital spot meter. And I've been studying the Ansel Adams zone system with this one to try to figure out how best to use that. Maybe I'll do a video on that one when I get a little more confident with my metering technique and uh, feel like I know a little more about what I'm talking about. And then lastly, when you get everything correct uh, and you get your exposures back, you have this tangible piece of film that you can hold in your hand and it just kind of, it's a different feeling than just a bunch of digital files being parked on a hard drive somewhere. Uh, it's kind of like printing your work. So even with digital, when you print your work, uh, you just have this, it becomes this thing in the physical world that just means more, you know. I suppose it's a bit like carpentry or something. Um, you could just go buy a wooden box and be done with it. Or you could spend a bunch of time and a lot of money buying tools and materials to work with your hands. It's not as quick or convenient. Uh, it'll definitely have its flaws and quirks to it, but at the end, you'll have something you're proud of that you built with your hands, you know? Uh, it's kind of the same thing going on here with this old grandpa looking camera I got, so. So for those of you who also shoot film, uh, particularly large format, I have a question for you. So I have a couple labs on my list uh, to check out, but if you have any recommendations of places you take your film to that do really good work, I'd sure appreciate the advice. So uh, leave me a comment if you wouldn't mind, and thank you. So that's all I have for this one. Uh, I don't see this replacing my digital workflow anytime soon. Um, more like just adding to it and keeping things kind of mixed up and interesting. Um, I think it'll be a while before I'm confident enough shooting with this one to consider it any sort of a main shooter or anything. But if you want to follow along in my journey learning large format photography, be sure to hit the subscribe button below. Ring the bell if you want to be notified when I release a new video. Um, and I just want to say thanks for watching. Keep an eye out for those Death Valley videos. Um, with any luck, I'll have those stitched together and start uploading them within the next couple of weeks or less. Uh, all right, just wanna say thanks again and uh, I'll see you guys later.